for being here and not at AWP. We, we appreciate that, honestly, <laughs> since that's where all of Kenyan Review seems to be. Uh, and it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Sarah Weinman to you today. Um, she is, of course, the author of The Real Lolita, The Kidnapping of Sally Horner, and the novel that scandalized the world. Sarah has also edited the books Women Crime Writers, Eight Suspense Novels of the 1940s and 50s, published by Library of America, and Troubled Daughters, Twisted Wives, um, a, a, a collection of, a, a collection or two? A, co no, a collection. One collection. One, it's, no, but how many are in the collection? Uh, 14 stories. 14 stories. 14 stories. Troubled Daughters, Twisted Wives, published by Penguin. And she writes the Crime Lady newsletter, which I highly recommend. So how many people are here for the true crime? And how many people are here for Lolita? And how many people are here for Bose? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so how did the 1948 kidnapping of Sally Horner inform the novel Nabokov had already begun to write? What does the novelist owe, if anything, to the real victim of the real crime? Nabokov has long been accused of making a beautiful work of art out of a sustained criminal act of sexual abuse. Does literature have to be moral to be beautiful? We're delighted to have this hybrid book here with us today, really straddling two worlds that are unusual. Um, you know, a great work of literature that's also controversial and a history of a true crime and putting them together. Um, Sarah herself is something of a hybrid. Um, she has published fiction. Um, in some anthologies, in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, and Alfred Hitchcock Magazine, and she also has a master's degree in forensic science. So um, it seems to me inevitable that she would write this book. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Weinman. So first, Catherine, thank you so, for such an amazing introduction and for bringing me to Kenya. Thank you to all, all of you for being here. And Already, I think that uh, this is a wonderful place, and I can see how inspiring and fantastic that it is. So, before I read, I thought I would. A more quickly. Just, a, yeah, just a little louder. Yeah, sorry. Before I read, I thought that I would talk a little bit about, I guess, the hybrid nature <laughs> of how I got to writing this book. And it's interesting, Catherine, that you said that it seemed inevitable. Because I suppose looking back, it does feel inevitable. It's this fusion of all the things that I've been interested in, all of my obsessions, all of my professional interests. But of course, whenever you're in the middle of a project or even starting it, nothing seems inevitable at all. It's only retroactive or in hindsight that everything just seems like it all fits together. And so to sort of flash back to a few years ago, it was probably close to the end of 2013. And by that point, I was well into a career writing about crime, but especially crime at the intersection of culture and specifically mid 20th century culture. Um, as you could, may note from the introduction, I edited a couple of anthologies. And while those are stories and novels by women crime writers in their fiction, it's that mid-century element, that post-World War II feeling of there's been this you know, great upheaval. A, a war has caused the death of millions and millions. It's just changed how we think of society. And as the men have gone off to war, the women have gone off to work. And when those men who have survived the war come back, there's this expectation that gender and sexual mores are supposed to go back to the way things were. And to some degree they do, but to a large extent they don't. And so it's that whole tension between what we perceive, especially America, to be and what is actually going on the darker side, the more paranoid, the more paranoid side, the more criminal side. That's what I've been trying to get at my whole, really my whole professional life. So it's mid to late 2013, I've just finished writing and I'm waiting for publication of a, of a story, interestingly enough, not mid-century. It was about a guy who was serving a life sentence for murder who had won a private detective novel contest. But as soon as I heard that backstory, I was like, I have to write that story. <laughs> so it was all ready to go. And of course, thinking, what am I going to work on next? And being a child of the internet 
and having that aforementioned degree in forensic science, which didn't lead to me being a forensic scientist, in part because the lab and I were not suited. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a macro thinker in a micro world. I'm much more interested in cases. The things that have obsessed me and haunted me are real crimes involving real people and not necessarily you know, trying to get the pipette to work over and over again and failing miserably. <laughs> so all of that is to say, I'm looking around and I'm reading some weird mixture of Wikipedia entries and their associated footnotes, Reddit threads, web sleuths and other um, amateur sleuth message boards. And out of that weird cocktail of websites and forums, I fall down a rabbit hole and I land on a piece that had been published in the Times Literary Supplement in 2005 by a Nabokov scholar named Alexander Dolanin. It's called What Happened to Sally Horner? And I was like, I want to know what happened to Sally Horner. And more to the point, it posited that this kidnapping in 1948 of an 11-year-old girl named Sally Horner was not only included in Lolita, which it is, in a line, which I'll get to into in a moment, but that there are, the connections were actually much deeper and more substantive than scholars and people really knew. And I was immediately intrigued not only as a crime journalist, but as someone who had read Lolita at the age of 16. I was a precocious kid. Um, I had just come off reading. I'm from Canada, so my sense of literature is a little bit different. You know, our gods are Margaret Atwood and Alice Munro and Mordecai Richler and Margaret Lawrence, these are the people I was reading in high school. And, so, and somehow we were reading One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Solzhenitsyn, and I thought, hmm, dissident literature. Um, this seems controversial, salacious, sure, I'll read Lolita. <laughs> so I read it, and it was a very thrilling and disturbing experience, but it's one that I remember not for what may be the usual things, but because it, I really understood for the first time that someone could write an unreliable narrator, that Humbert Humbert was not telling me what was really going on. He was trying to tell what he, he was trying to deliver the story he wanted us to know, but it wasn't really the story that is happening. And so all of which is to say, I read Lolita, and it wasn't a novel that I was like, rereading over and over again, but it was a novel, of course, that I remember, because how can you not remember it? It's about a middle-aged man's illicit, illegal, obsessive desire for a 12-year-old girl. This is hard to forget. So, I'm reading this piece by Alexander Dolanin, and very intrigued, and then I think, had anyone reported out Sally's story as a crime story? And I wondered, was there anyone still alive? remember what Sally was like? Were there court documents I could track down and access? Were there other newspaper reports, other documents, other bits of information that I could use to put together this narrative? And could I find even deeper connections between what happened to Sally and the making and the publishing of Lolita? And so of course, before I read the section where in my book, we first get to know Sally Horn and what happened, I thought I would quote the line that's actually in Lolita. And so I'll quote it, and then what I'm curious is whether people, if it rings a bell. And so late in the novel, for those of you who have read it, Humbert Humbert has essentially come back to the scene of the crime, to Ramsdale. It's several years after event, the events that have transpired. Dolores Hayes is in the wind elsewhere. And he thinks to himself, and of course, as was Nabokov's technique, it's an parenthetical, which means it's what it's as close to the truth as we're going to get, as opposed to the main narrative, which is Humbert, what Humbert, Humbert is trying to tell us, what we're meant to know. So in that parenthetical, he says, had I done to Dolly, Dolly being Dolores Hayes, or Lolita, had I done to Dolly, perhaps, what Frank LaSalle, a 50-year-old mechanic, had done to 11-year-old Sally Horner in 1948. And so for those of you who've read the novel, was this, a, was this a parenthetical that leaped out at you? Was this something you paid attention to? 
Right. It, I also <laughs> did not pay attention at all when I first read it. And that's because that's the genius of Lolita, is there's so much else going on. There's so many, there's a reason Catherine's holding it. There's <laughs> not one, but two <laughs> versions of the annotated Lolita. There so much, and actually, there is a, um, Sally Horner is referenced in there, but Appel gets her name wrong. And there's no reason why. So Sally is referenced not just there, but very gl uh, glancingly in Brian Boyd's two volume uh, masterful biography of Nabokov. And there are other little bits here and there, but that's the point is that her story had been entirely subsumed by this, by Nabokov. And so what is her story? She's 11 year years old in Camden, New Jersey in 1948. And she encounters this mechanic, Frank LaSalle, two months out of prison. And as I'll describe, they meet, and then eventually he takes her against her will. And in that 21-month cross-country odyssey, which is of course a nightmare, she goes from Camden to Atlantic City, to Baltimore, to Dallas, finally to San Jose, where she's ultimately rescued through the efforts of an enterprising and exceedingly complicated neighbor. And then Sally, who is by then 13, only has two and a half years, more years to live. And when, upon her death, Vladimir Nabokov reads like a newswire AP story about it. And it's at a critical juncture. He's been writing Lolita for several years. But it's with this, you know, reading about Sally's death. And it's, I think, quite likely that he knew of her rescue because it was front page news on newspapers coast to coast across the Atlantic, even as far flung as Australia and New Zealand. So it, it was pretty well covered at the time. But it was with her death, that's the news, the wire story that he recopied on a note card, one of 94 note cards, that is all that's left of his manuscript, his writing process of Lolita. He burned the manuscript, most of the other, uh, most of whatever else he wrote down is, is gone. But that note card, is in the Library of Congress, which has uh, part of Nabokov's archives, the rest are at the New York Public Library. And reading it, I have to say, reading Nabokov's notes, reading him write Sally Horner's name, it was indescribable. It's like here they were coming together. And it's not, it's proof of, of a kind, but more to the point, it's here's how the conversation between this real little girl who didn't get a chance to grow up, who didn't have a chance for people to really get to know her, for her to love and be loved, for, to be amongst family who still remembers her 67 years after, her, almost 67 years after she died, for this real girl to connect up with the fictional girl. And so let me introduce you to Sally Horner in short, reading. It starts chapter one. So it's the spring of 1948. Sally Horner walked into the Woolworths on Broadway and Federal in Camden, New Jersey to steal a five cent notebook. She'd been dared to by the clique of girls she desperately wanted to join. Sally had never stolen anything in her life. Usually she went to that particular five and dime her school supplies, and her favorite candy. The clique told her it would be easy. Nobody would suspect a girl like Sally, a fifth grade honor pupil and president of the Junior Red Cross Club at Northeast School, to be a thief. Despite her mounting dread at breaking the law, she believed them. She had no idea a simple act of shoplifting on a March afternoon in 1948 would destroy her life. Once inside Woolworths, Sally reached for the first notebook she spied on the gleaming white nickel counter. She stuffed it into her bag and walked away, careful to look straight ahead to the exit door. Before she could cross the threshold to freedom, she felt a hand grab her arm. Sally looked up. A slender, hawk-faced man loomed above her, iron gray hair, underneath a wide-brimmed fedora, eyes shifting between blue and gray. A scar sliced his cheek by the right side of his nose, while his shirt collar shrouded another mark on his throat. 
the hand gripping Sally's arm bore the traces of an even older half-moon stamp forged by fire. Any adult would have sized him up as middle-aged, but to ten-year-old Sally, he looked positively ancient. I am an FBI agent, the man said to Sally, and you are under arrest. Sally did what many young girls would have done in a similar situation. She cried. She cowered. She felt immediately ashamed. The man's low voice and steely gaze froze her in place. He pointed across the way to City Hall, the tallest building in Camden. That's where girls like her would be dealt with, he said. Sally didn't understand his meaning at first. Then he explained, to punish her for stealing, she would be sent to the reformatory. Sally didn't know that much about reform school, but what she knew was not good. She kept crying. Then his stern manner brightened. It was a lucky break for her, a little girl like her, he said, that he was the one who caught her and not some other FBI agent. If she agreed to report to him from time to time, he would let her go, spare her the worst, show her some mercy. Sally stopped crying. He was going to let her go. She wouldn't have to call her mother from jail. Her poor, overworked mother, Ella, still struggling with the consequences of the suicide of her alcoholic husband, Sally's father, five years earlier, still tethered to her seamstress job, which meant that Sally, too often, went home to an empty house after school. But she couldn't think about that not when she was about to escape real punishment. Any desire she felt about joining the girls' club fell away. Overcome by relief, she wouldn't face a much larger fear. Sally did not know the reprieve had an expiration date, one that would come due at any time without warning. a few months pass and Sally thinks she's safe and then she encounters Frank LaSalle one more time on the way home from school and he ups the ante and he says you not only could be going to the reformatory if you do, don't do what I say but you have to spin a story to your mother that essentially LaSalle is the father of her friends and that he's going to take her to, the, to Atlantic City for a week and so to our modern ears, the fact that Ella agrees to this after only a telephone conversation with a strange man might seem unfathomable, inconceivable. I think it was important for me to understand the behavior of all involved, whether it be someone like Ella, who really had a hard scrabble life and had a real rough time keeping the lights on. She, didn't, she had another older daughter, Susan, who she didn't have to support anymore, but Susan was about to give birth to her first child, who would eventually be born while Sally was in captivity. And so Ella had no means to give her daughter, to give Sally a vacation. And so that was her justification, however illogical it might seem in hindsight. But she thought, well, if Sally gets a week away to the shore, it's not something that I could do, but maybe this will be good. And so a week turns into two weeks, turns into several weeks, letters, phone calls, lies, uh, stories under duress, and then finally Sally tells Ella, we're off to Baltimore and I don't want to write or call anymore. And that's when something wakes up inside Ella's mind and she realizes something terrible has truly happened and calls the police and they're brought in and it becomes not just a girl who's gone away of her own volition, but a kidnapping that stretches all across the country, as I described. And of course, it's not just that it stretches all across the country, it's that Sally seems to be out and about in the world. She goes to Catholic school. There are people who encounter her, who later offer statements that they never saw anything amiss. And again, it's the tension between what people weren't seeing at the time and what we now understand, that even if someone is not under physical shackles, the mental and psychological bonds might be even darker and stronger than we can ever know. That's what master manipulators do. 
And that's what Nabokov and Lolita, I think, really demonstrates brilliantly. We're in Humbert Humbert's head. And so the language that he uses, the way that he's seducing not only Dolores Hayes, but he's seducing the reader. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a neat trick. And now that I've reread Lolita several times, I still find myself getting seduced. I still find myself going, finding myself in some degree of almost non-consensual sympathy with Humbert Humbert. I mean, it's, it's I, don't, I still wonder how he does it, and that's why I keep wanting to reread Lolita to figure out how Nabokov did it. But one thing I do know is that it wasn't something that he just conjured up out of thin air. It took several creative, some were false starts, some were tangents, some were alley, uh, different, going down different alleys. But he came up with the premise of Lolita as far back as the gift when he wrote a couple of paragraphs, which were essentially a summary of what became Lolita. He wrote a novella, The Enchanter, in Russian. It was never translated into English in his lifetime. But once it was, one could see the precursor from a story and thematic standpoint to Lolita. One could also see why it didn't quite work and why Lolita just stood head and shoulders above this earlier effort. And he was working on it as far back as like 1947, 48, with letters, describing it in letters to his eventual frenemy, Edmund Wilson. It was called Kingdom by the Sea. She, uh, Dolores Hayes would have different names. At one point, she was Juanita Dark, which is essentially a riff on Jeanne d'Arc. So he was working through it. And in a way, knowing that Nabokov struggled with Lolita, that he came close to burning it, to tossing it into a fire before his wife, Vera, who was not just his wife, but his everything, his amanuensis, his agent, his brand manager, his co-teacher, you name it, she basically did it if it was not something related to writing. And so the fact that she talked him through, that she saved Lolita is also fascinating and interesting and it was to me. So knowing that Lolita just didn't come out like Athena from Zeus's brain or whatever, um, <laughs> it was heartening in a way because a real struggle that I had writing the book was I knew I could figure out how to make Sally Horner as human as possible even with the limited amount of information that I had. I had a lot of information about Nabokov, but he was less human than me. And so I had to sort of imagine my way into this great genius's brain. How could I, how could my brain stand up against Nabokov's brain? But I think understanding that he also struggled, that the finished work is a lot different from where it started out, that gave me the confidence to at least be like, okay, if I can at least attempt to humanize this man and humanize his creative journey, I can also understand why he made the choices that he made and what responsibility he, and thus all writers have, to real stories that involve trauma and pain. And so where I come down, because this is a question I get asked is, so how do you feel about Lolita now? And frankly, I still feel the way that I did before I started on The Real Lolita, which is, it's one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. Writing my book didn't change that, but what I wanted to do, and what I still hope will happen, is that knowing about Sally Horner complicates the narrative. I'm not here to erase the narrative, I'm not here to even change it, but I do want to complicate it and I do want to open up a conversation as opposed to uh, closing it down. I think that having Sally Horner's story alongside Lolita it just makes for more interesting and richer conversations, but more to the point, knowing about this real girl and all other girls and women and people and humans who have suffered along similar lines, it's a reminder that they matter. And if we remember that they matter, it makes us better people and better humans too. So with that, thank you so much, and I'd be delighted to uh, discuss it further or take questions. I have a question. <laughs> so, well, first, Humbert Humbert isn't Nabokov. Uh, 
No, but he's as good a writer as Nabokov, <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's part of the um, the guile. Uh, do you think that Sally Horner's death is almost the most important <coughs> um, influence? In, on the book, in the sense that he was already writing the story before he, before Sally Horner was kidnapped, but reading that she had died in a car accident um, just a couple of years after her rescue, do you think it gave him the ending for Lolita that killing her off became inevitable in in the novel? I feel like even if he'd had in mind that Dolores was going to die young, die in childbirth, obviously Sally did not die in childbirth, but real life can sometimes jive really well with what you're already thinking about creatively and thematically. And so if this had already been in his mind, it's almost like the universe was bolstering whatever his authorial instincts were. And so my sense is, even if he had never read about Sally Horner, Lolita would have existed in some form that, that is similar to what we were actually gifted with. But isn't, I mean, that's sort of the alchemy and the mystery of creation is that you do sort of take magpie-like from influences here and there and they sometimes arrive just when you need them. And so Sally, you know, when Nabokov read about Sally's death, it was at a fortuitous time in the creation of Lolita. And so my point is just to highlight that and to show that without necessarily condemning him because to condemn him for doing that would also be to condemn any writer, and I include myself, for drawing on real life as inspiration. But it is important to at least recognize and to contextualize those real life inspirations. Yes. As I recall, the novel ends long after their erotic adventures and their well-registered, it's a great travel book, let's face it. But uh, he goes to find her long after their erotic adventures and travels have passed, and she's living a life of utter mediocrity from which he begs to rescue her, and she declines. What, that has nothing to do with the actual person you're talking about, no. right? And I do make clear that the parallels between what happened to Sally Horner and what happened to Dolores Hayes, they do sort of reach an inflection point and then they diverge because Sally died in 52, but the narrative also ends in 52. Yeah. Interesting. I know there are a lot of weird Nabokovian arguments about was it this date, was it that date, was it a mistake? And, you know, I come down on the side of that Nabokov was human, he made mistakes too. <laughs> So, yes, they do diverge, just as there's no Claire Quilty analog in yeah. what happened to Sally Horner. But there's enough that does mimic or does parallel what happened with Sally's real life, that there is this road trip narrative, even though, of course, as I also detail in the book, Nabokov went on plenty of road trips with Vera, with their son Dimitri, with graduate students, including one Dorothy who told, who gamely drove them cross country and didn't really know them all that well. So just to be able to trust someone like that to drive 3,000 miles hunting for butterflies is quite a commitment. <laughs> but he comes to her rescue, or attempts to come to her rescue, when he finds her living a thoroughly mediocre life. Well, that's, I mean, we only have Humbert's word. Why should we believe that? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you believe that? Why that she's living him? a miserable life? Why would I believe anything he says? He lies well, that's anything. a soul uh, <laughs> That's your choice. <laughs> I mean, look at his version of what happened in the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel. I have no reason to believe anything that Humbert Humbert is saying because he, his agenda is he wants to tell his version of the story. And that's also what, why there's the brilliance of the parentheticals because it's like he can't help himself. The truth will come out. Yes. Um, you mentioned um, that people still remembered Sally Horner. Did you actually like interview family at all? I did. Um, what was that like, sort of bringing that into your narrative? Um, and like, what has their reception been, sort of? Or like, yeah, how 
how did you sort of like make them comfortable and like how did their perspective really like help you, I guess? I don't know. So when I first started reporting on what became the book, it was originally a magazine piece. And at that point, Sally's brother-in-law, Al Panero, was still alive. Her sister Susan had died two years prior, so I never got a chance to talk with her. And Ella had died in 1998, so there was no talking to her. But I spoke with Al and I mostly spoke and still am in touch with Sally's niece, Diana. And so Diana had been born in August of 48, only a few days after everybody realized that this was not an extended vacation, this was a, a, a kidnapping. And so she didn't remember Sally all that well. She described it, I and mean, she's only four when her aunt died. So really her memories were based on photographs or this one film clip that I was able to see, which itself kind of blew me away because to see Sally move to interact with her family was just, even though there was no sound, even though I did, had no idea of her, her voice, it still, again, made her more human in my mind. And so they were, I think, a lot kinder and a lot more on board than I expected. Mm -hmm. But I think they just wanted, they hoped that people would remember her. But they had no idea before I reached out to them that Sally was even mentioned or inspired, that she was an inspiration for Lolita. Wow. Yeah. And when I spoke with Another woman who has since passed away, um, she was then Carol Starts. And then when I spoke to her, she was Carol Taylor. She had been Sally's best friend in the last year of her life. And so Carol's recollections of two telephone conversations really gave me an insight into what it was like for Sally being 14, 15, having come back from this terribly traumatic ordeal to the same community, the same school, the same people, Everybody knew what was up, but it was 1951-52. So instead of recognizing it as a traumatic ordeal, they just thought, oh, she was a slut. And so she didn't have that many friends, and she was very lonely. But Carol didn't care, because she's like, something bad happened, and there's no reason to judge. And so Carol had gone with Sally on the last weekend of her life. And it's then that Sally made a fateful decision not to go home with her best friend, but to get a ride with this cute older boy that she'd been hanging out with all weekend. And that also proved to be a terrible mistake. And so the impression that Carol made upon me is that she only knew Sally for a year, but she still remembered her so vividly and still felt that Sally had almost like taught her how to be a lady, that she had given her some wisdom and some advice, which, and that she still remembered and felt, at least the way she conveyed it to me, that she still kind of lived her life by, which was amazing. And it still kind of makes me, I'm still thinking about that. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, uh, let's say this, like when you're talking um, about like very stressful stuff with these people and it's stuff that's really far back, um, it would be my guess that people tend to remember things and people and etc. as positively as possible in that scenario. And when you're taking like a serious journalistic approach to this sort of thing, how do you how do you weigh what people like? How is it just a intuition thing at that point? I mean, there's some ability to corroborate and fact check based yeah. on available records. But sort of to your more specific point about talking about trauma, one of the other people who was very helpful was were the two daughter, two two of the daughters of the woman who engineered Sally's rescue. So when I initially wrote the piece, which was published by Hazlitt, which is part of Penguin Random House Canada, I only knew about Ruth Janish, who's the neighbor, just from news reports, and I found out about her existence maybe a couple of weeks before I had to file the piece. So it meant that the version of her that's in the piece is quite heroic, but it's sort of, it's only based on news reports. And then when I started talking to her daughters, a much more complicated portrait emerged of her, where yes, she did this heroic act, but as, to paraphrase one of her daughters, it was essentially the one decent thing that Ruth did in her life. <laughs> and the rest of her life, did not make up for it. And so 
I feel like my book is not only a chronicle of how a, a young girl's kidnapping and tragic life was used as gross for literary mill, but it's also a chronicle of really damaged, complicated women and how we have to understand that the binaries that we often put people in, and especially women, like especially this whole like Madonna horror complex and good and evil, it, it's, it does everybody a disservice. People are human. When you're human, you make, cho you make decisions that sometimes are tremendously beneficial and sometimes are tremendously damaging. And sometimes you can do that all in the same day. And it doesn't make you a different person, it just makes you a person. And so to, it, it was sort of incumbent upon me to have as much empathy and as much understanding as I could allow. But it also meant, and this I always do with reporting in general, is I try to come from a place of moral culpability. And what that means is, is that you know I'm coming in with my own biases and complications and heroism and damage. And so if sort of I can bring what I have and meet the person I'm talking to and get to some common place, then there's more trust. And then I'll get the information that I need. But I also recognize that it's not just about a transactional thing, which is why I'm still in, you know, I'm very fortunate that I am still in touch with the women who talk to me. Not like every day, but I mean, I did hear from Diana the other week, and I know that periodically there are reasons to check in with her and see how she's doing and the like, or check in with Ruth Janish's daughters and see how they're doing, because they're human beings and that's what you're supposed to do, or I feel like that's what you're supposed to do. Do we know how much Nabokov knew of the story, the real life story that you tell? Well, so we, there is that note card, which I described earlier on, and that's in the Library of Congress. And we also know, I mean, the fact that he references Sally Horner directly in the text. There's only one other case that he references in the text, which is the story of George Edward Grammer, a man who staged the murder of his wife as a car accident. And that is also a fascinating story. I wrote a whole long piece about that last year. And so when about a decade, I'm sorry, Lolita came out in 55, the American version came out in 58. So five years after that, which was a year after the film with Sue Lyon as Lolita and James Mason as Humber, directed by Stanley Kubrick, a year after that film was out, there's a piece in a men's magazine called Nugget, <laughs> which was essentially kind of trying to be a more intellectual version of Playboy. It had really good contributors. It had Seymour Krim, who was tight with the beats editing. So there's a whole history of that that could be written, but that's a little beyond my scope. So a young freelance writer named Peter Welding, who was a Philadelphia native, wrote a piece in the November 63 issue, which connected Sally to Lolita. And he makes a case, his case is strong in some places and it's not so strong in others. But it's enough that a New York Post reporter writes the Nabokovs, who by then are living in Switzerland, to say, so what's the deal? Is Sally Horner the inspiration for Lolita? And Vera, writing on both her and Vladimir's behalf, writes this extraordinary letter, which is reprinted in full in the book, which essentially is like, yes, Sally's name is in Lolita, but there are many other girls who, who inspired Lolita, and she's not the only one. What I also found interesting, because I looked for things not only in his archives at the Library of Congress, but also at the New York Public Library, he kept a ridiculous amount of ephemera related to the publication and, and cultural afterlife of Lolita. I mean, if you're, you're keeping the centerfold version of Zsa Zsa Gabor in Cosmopolitan magazine dressed as Lolita, you're keeping <laughs> other, like, paparazzi shots of Sue Lyon as they're shooting Lolita the film, or Italian magazines of girls who are dressing up as Lolita. You keep that, but you, there's nothing on Sally Horner. It just struck me as extremely odd. And so, you know, you, you, it's, it's not that I'm saying, this isn't here, therefore, 
but it's a striking, it's an absence that is striking enough that it was worth mentioning and trying to contextualize. Yes? Why do you think it adds to the book to attach a real name to it? Because personally, I mean, obviously you're a true crime writer, so that makes sense, but if you're watching the news, stuff just kind of goes by you and it's not the names that make it stick. I feel like his book did the opposite of what you're kind of implying. I feel like I've never had such a visceral reaction to any true crime as I had to that book. That book made me nauseous. And I feel like that actually gives it much more of a punch. I'm so glad you said that because I feel like more people are having that reaction now. But the reaction when Lolita was published in the 50s was not that. It was primarily, I mean, I still remember what the Canadian writer Robertson Davies wrote in his review of the novel, and I'm going to paraphrase this badly, but essentially that this is a novel about, not so much about a child corrupted by a man, by a, but, a, but, a, but about a man who is corrupted by a child. It's the fact that James Harris, who was the producing partner with Stanley Kubrick on the 1962 film, said in multiple interviews, we needed to make this a dark love story. Mm -hmm. that, that readers of the time, and too many today, still view Lolita as a comedy. Yes, it's, it's, it has funny moments. It has comic elements. These are important. But I just did not want the fact that this is a story of a girl who was repeatedly raped, who was kidnapped, who was taken against her will. The narrative is structured so that there is an amnesia that can creep over you. So I'm glad that you did not feel that. And I hope that many, many others feel similar to you. Is, is there any evidence in your reading, not necessarily in Nabokov's files, but in your actual reading, that he was influenced or intrigued at least by LaSalle's having in effect seduced the mother before he seduced the child, which is exactly what Humbert Humbert does by marrying her and then killing her, but seduced the mother to get to the child. That is what LaSalle did. Do, do you, I mean, it's a more so the, the mother, by, yes, but he seduced her with, you know, offering this vacation for yeah. a child. But do you feel that, that um, it may have added a dimension to his sense of the role of the mother? I mean, I haven't heard, thought of that expressly, but at the same time, I definitely feel that there's a correlation between how El Ella behaved and the way that Charlotte Hayes behaves. And so, I, again, I think I, I feel like the elements were already there, but Sally's story helped to bring them all together. Now, because there isn't textual evidence of Nabokov knowing about Sally's rescue or even her kidnapping, which was less widely reported than her rescue, it's not like I could say, here is direct evidence of such. As I say, as I say in the introduction of the book, I'm coming from a place of building essentially a circumstantial case. It's not really a circumstantial case against Nabokov, it's more a circumstantial case for what he knew, when he knew it, and how he used Sally's story to help him create and finish Lolita. So going along those lines of circumstantial evidence, I feel like it's, I, I, I wouldn't rule out your, your supposition there. Mm -hmm. Question, but I'll kind of to ramble as I get to it. But um, I, I also hear you making a case which we, which is going to be a difficult conversation, I think, for years to come of how do we deal with artwork, which is both, um, as you said, this is one of the most brilliant novels of the 20th century. There are folks who might say, oh, no, no, the subject is, a, it, is it, it, we should not read this book. Does that make sense? Yeah. But how, but years ago, and then this is here at Kenyon, um, 
My Angela was speaking so long time ago, but she finally she told us a story, a, a, a horrific story about something that happened to her uncle. She said, I'm telling you that not for sympathy, but for you to know that anything that any human does, I could do. Um, meaning, this could have been me in another circumstance doing this kind of act to another human being. Um, and I just wondered, you must be getting unusual response because I think we're floundering at the moment about how to, how to deal with what we choose and when it's right, as you said, we need to recognize things, but how do we have truth and reconciliation? Yeah, I mean, isn't that, that's like the biggest question. I mean, if we really want to expand the scope, all we have to do is go back to the way that this country was founded on slaves. Like, it's, we're awash in how to deal or not to deal with truth and reconciliation. But I think especially as it relates to trauma, and especially as it relates to art done by terrible humans, I mean, I feel like Lolita is a window into terrible humans. It's not art done by a terrible human. So there's the distinction there. But even with art done by terrible humans, and I'm generalizing because I don't want to point out specifics, but I also feel like we, each of us is smart enough to make our own decision about what art we wish to consume, how we wish to consume it, what, what we wish to do with it. I'm not, some, I, I'm not comfortable with canceling art, but I am comfortable with contextualizing art, with saying, here's this piece of work, here's the person who created it here, the circumstances under which it was made, here are the personality traits attached to the person who made it, and here's why we need to know this, or here's why we don't need to know this. So maybe it comes down to, you know, you have speech and then you add more speech to it. But I think if you hear ambivalence in my voice, it's more to the effect of, I'm not here to simplify narratives. I really think that dwelling in everything that's messy and complicated and fraught and uncomfortable, it does ultimately, I hope, lead to greater good. There's time for one more. Is everyone just stunned? Uh, yeah. Completely <laughs> non, so I don't want to take a question away from someone. But, um, okay. As someone who um, has many friends and colleagues and family members who both read widely across various different disciplines, but they also love the mystery disciplines, um, both true and, and invented. But there is a little bit of, well, I'm reading a mystery now. There's this kind of excuse for reading the mystery. Or I think true crime is, I just wonder, how did, how did, how did you get a, did, this is just a silly biographical, but did you stumble upon mystery as a young child? Did your, you know, your, your parents say, oh, you have to read Nancy Drew? Or, um, and how do you deal with that notion of mystery being somehow less worthy? Oh, I reject that entirely. <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll get that part out of the way. I've been, I've been reading cr about crime since I was a child. I mean, I like to joke in part because it's true that when I was little and I would, at that time I was a baseball fan, but because I grew up in Ottawa and Canada, the, my team no longer exists, RIP Expos. So somehow we had the baseball encyclopedia in our house and of course, Eight-year-old me was like, "Oh, let me read about all the baseball players who died in like weird circumstances." <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was me. Um, I think crime fascinates me. Be in, it's something to, that you said that we could all we're all capable of horrible, evil things. All it takes is the right or the wrong circumstance to get us in the place to commit those acts. Most of us will not. Some of us might, and we might never know, and some of us do, and we know immediately. And so I feel like it's that thin line between staying on the right side and staying on and crossing over. I'm fat. It's like looking into the abyss, and the abyss looks back into you. You sort of peer, and you really hope that you don't fall in. So that's what I, I always feel existentially is happening when I'm 
dealing with crime stories. But as I get older, I find that some of that, it's not that it's ebbed, but I think when I was younger, I was less mindful of the human impact and the emotional impact. And now I find when I am reading the Reddit threads and message boards that I mentioned before, I get really frustrated because people treat crime stories as a game, as a riddle to be solved. And that has its event, you know, that has its charms, but I think it just doesn't charm me in the same way that it did when I was younger. There's one case that I know I'm going to be writing about. I was reading a thread about it, and someone chimed in after outlandish theory after outlandish theory and said, I'm from that town, I knew that woman. We couldn't prove it, but it's a pretty simple thing what happened. And, it's, and I thought, yeah, like, sometimes the further out you get and the more awash you are in theory and creating a grand unified theory of narrative, the more you miss what's right in front of you that can actually be simpler, sadder, more traumatic. So I think that's, if my career is evolving as a writer, I think that's what I hope to be more mindful of is just the real impact and how it affects actual people.